Well, first of all, thank you all for being here because because of you, I'm here. So I really appreciate all of you where you're sitting and being here today. So thank you, thank you. Um, when I was first invited to do one of these lectures, I got to see the list of the words for the lectures. And I love the idea that it's just a word. And as we're sitting here today, if you can imagine the map, the world map with all those little dots of other people in the world who are speaking about this one word, transparency. So this collective idea that we're connected to other people. And to imagine maybe even looking on the internet later at some of these other lectures and thinking about how far they're pushing the concept of transparency, either literally or figuratively. So for me, my first thought in that was literally. I work with glass. And I went to the University of New Hampshire. I studied sculpture and fine arts there. I was carving wooden figures with a chainsaw and drawing in black and white and thought that, you know, color was just, ugh, you know. <laughs> and it was after school that I ended up just by chance working for a glass artist. And I didn't even think that glass was a material that I would like, but then slowly the color, I think it was the color and the transparency that grabbed me. So I want to back up a little bit. I spoke about my work in places where people know about glass or people who are makers. And this audience is my local home. I've lived on South Street uh, for the past 20 years. And I want to show you a little bit of my background and um, why I'm so proud to be um, from New Hampshire. So when it said hippie van, this is true. <laughs> um, the woman on the far right with the glasses, that's my mother. She is a woman of the 50s who grabbed on to the life of the 60s. When she was divorced, she moved my brother and I. I'm the one who, um, it's a terrible picture of me. The, one <laughs> the little one down there next to her with my hand on the dog. And um, she grabbed um, her two children and raised them in Thornton, New Hampshire. And she thought it was a great idea to buy an uninsulated A-frame. Um, so I really learned how to stoke a fire um, at an early age, because she wasn't that good at it. Um, and this was my community. I can't say that we lived in a commune, but it was very close to that. There were lots of adults that came and go. You know, some of them that we knew ended up being school teachers in the um, area. And it was a really loving environment of all these people who were passionate. We grew up, so my mother, myself, and my brother. At the time, we used to joke that my brother had longer hair than I did. Um, but she was really and is the most influential person in my life for how brave I think that she has been in her life and how all my childhood, she has always said, do what you love and the money will figure itself out. Today, she has two pennies to rub together. Then she had two pennies to rub together. <laughs> but she always followed what was passionate to her. So I can honestly say she's a happy person. She's been happy <laughs> her whole life. Um, if I came to her and said, Mom, you know, I want to do underwater basket weaving, she'd be like, that's great. I totally support you. <laughs> you know, I won't give you any money, but I totally support you. So it's always been this drive <laughs> in my life to find something that I truly love. And I say that now to my children. And they're like, yeah, I know, Mama, do what you love, she, they say to me. But this is her legacy. And I feel so grateful that that was part of my upbringing. This, being a woman of the 50s, she went to Filene's basement, and she got these beads. And when I was a little kid, I saw them in the jewelry box, and I knew that they were kind of made by dripping something. And I knew they were glass because I could tip them on my teeth. And I love the fact that this still exists in my life, this necklace. But this was my beginning in glass. When I got out of UNH, I ended up working for a glass artist who's very well respected in the um, glass community in the world. His name is Dan Daly. I worked for him for four years. And one of my jobs, these vases are about two and a half feet tall. 
one of my jobs was enameling these vases with a toothpick. So I'd sharpen the toothpick, and I'd mix the enamels, and I'd put these little dots on there for weeks on end. It took about three weeks to finish one of these vases. Um, and then one night, I saw somebody flame working. So this is me flame working, but you can imagine I being the person here with the sunglasses looking, thinking, oh my goodness, you can do glass by yourself? Because I had seen these vases being blown out in Seattle and shipped around the world. Um, I was fascinated by the idea that you could manipulate glass by yourself. So I went home, got a torch, um, called up a friend who gave me a regulator and oxygen and propane, and I was on my way. So the, what the technique is, rods of glass, torch, melting the glass on a little stainless steel mandrel. When you take it off the mandrel, you've got a hole in it, and there's the bead. These are the rods of glass that I use. Um, these are set up in a factory in Italy. 90% of the glass that I use comes from Murano, which is a little island off of Venice, sleepy little town. This is um, going to work one morning. I teach there sometimes, and I have a lot of colleagues and friends. A quiet morning in Murano. And then these were the beginning beads that I started to do. Honestly, they weren't this good. This took me about two years to get this good. But I had a little postcard, and people would call me up, and they'd say, row number three, bead number seven. Could I have one of those, please? <laughs> and so it was my catalog. I was starting my life of independence and making these. And I loved it, loved it, loved it. It was, you know, you hear about 10,000 hours in order to get good at something. I, I swear I put in my 10,000 hours immediately. I just loved, <laughs> loved doing this. Um, and then going around to the bead world, very early on, I realized there was a um, bead museum in Prescott, Arizona that was having a contemporary glass bead show. This was in 1990. So I took a little picture of my beads and sent it in. I got into that exhibition. And that was the, really the beginning that solidified a group of us making contemporary glass beads in America. And um, there were about 30 people in the show. From that catalog, I've met many, many people. Also from, the, this is a little bit dark, but from that catalog, um, you know, there was the flower person and the marini person and the dot person. And I was the dot person, so I got named the dot queen. And it has stuck. <laughs> and um, so I'm known as the dot queen. So I kind of, you know, got going and put a lot of dots on those beads. <laughs> that, bead, that bead and that movement led to this book, which was very influential in the bead community by Cindy Jenkins. It's been translated in a couple languages. So that bead ended up on the cover here. And that was something that um, really gave me almost a calling card around the world. Um, and that bead is now in the contemporary, um, it's in the Corning Museum of Glass, and they used it as their timeline to represent contemporary glass bead making. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what I do and, and how I think about it. This is a picture of mosaics in Italy. When people ask me how I get inspired, it's usually through things that I see in travels. And strangely enough, it's often architecture, which is so big compared to the things that I do, which are so small. So I love trying to pack designs in really tightly, like those mosaics. This is the floor in San Marco in Venice. I love the idea also that the artisans who worked on this probably, of course, they got paid, but time ends up disappearing when you work. And I like to forget about the concept of time as money and just work from the idea of love and detail. This is a manhole cover in Luxembourg. I love the crenellation of the squares and the rounded. And then I try to fit that into my work. This is a brooch that is about two and a half inches large, big lapel brooch, and uh, it's sterling silver. I do all the metal work myself, too. This is um, a window in France, which I think looks like a brooch. And here is a large brooch. So you can think about all the brooches being you know, about two and a half inches wide. These are windows in Venice, in the back streets of Venice. I love those little points. And then I'm trying to translate that into the glass. Sometimes the glass 
happens and then I see an image and I think, oh my goodness, that looks just like this over here. So it's not as if it's a chicken and an egg, you know, which one comes first. It's not completely clear. These are um, architectural details in Jaipur, India. This is an older slide image, but you can see the, the details. It's in 18 karat gold. These are some of my beads, the large ones um, in the center that look like granite, are granite. They're these beads that are four inches tall and they're from Africa. Um, every time I try to figure out the date of them, people just say they're ancient. So I think they're around 900 AD and uh, they're hand drilled granite holes in them. They're beautiful. They have so much energy to them. So I tried to work and make beads that had this kind of feeling. And then the two on the right are from um, Eastern Europe in probably the 1700s. So working with that idea and, you know, going back to transparency, a lot of the colors that I work with they don't have that transparency in the sense that you're looking at a paperweight and you're looking right through the glass. The skim coat of transparency is very, very thin. And then there are opaque layers underneath it. So there are colors in order to create, let's say, that amber. There might be a very acid yellow underneath and then layers of light and dark ambers on top in order to create that palette. You see them when they break, you know, when one breaks in half and you look, oh, there's all the color in the inside. Um, this is a long um, brooch made from one of those beads. This is a, a window in a concrete wall in India, and I swear it must be like eight inches thick, and I love the idea of those pierced openings. And then I played around with making pierced openings um, on my brooches, trying to get them as big as I could and have them physically and visually light. I do drawings, uh, not of the beads themselves, but I'll draw the metalwork that I'm thinking about. So on the right and the left, it's the exact same bead, but it's on a different um, idea to be uh, put down for the metalwork. And there is a finished piece. So you can kind of see the, from the drawing to the piece. A piece very much like this uh, was collected by the Smithsonian Museum of Art, the Renwick Gallery, and it was shelved away in one of their drawers for years. And if you go down to Washington, D.C. right now, there's an exhibition. They've pulled it out, and it's um, on display. And I'm really proud that it's in the case with an Alexander Calder necklace. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm feeling really good about that. It's kind of like having a cocktail party, you know? It, so my, my piece is off, you know, having a cocktail party with Calder. <laughs> um, this is, think about the brooches. And what I've created, I call these constellation necklaces. Sometimes they're very uniform and have symmetry, and sometimes they're, um, you know, more diverse like this one, but I, all of them are constellation necklaces and I'm trying to pull them together. They're quite large. I made this one was commissioned for the Corning Museum of Glass. And again, it was shelved away in a drawer somewhere. And I knew that it wasn't in the warehouse down the road. I knew that it was in the building. And then um, when they um, put up their new wing, if anybody has a chance to go to Corning, New York, it's kind of in the Ithaca, Rochester, New York area. They have um, built a beautiful um, new wing. And I'm happy to say that, that it's up on the wall. Um, <laughs> so that is good, but I, I wanna definitely promote the museum itself. And speaking about transparency and glass, it is um, one of the centers of the world to learn about glass, learn about glass technology, in the arts and in manufacturing. Um, and then they have a teaching facility. This is the outside of the building. These are all glass panels. The top of it is um, all sunlight. And this is the interior. It's just so beautiful. The, one of my favorite parts are the um, concrete beams that don't even touch the walls. And then you have these undulating walls on the inside. It's just really worth the seven hour road trip that it takes to get there, <laughs> which I seem to go often. Um, so now going back down to details, I want to um, show you some more of the constellation necklaces. When I work them, I, I make beads and beads and beads and start to pull them together to see if they talk to each other. And then, um, then after that, I'll do the metal work. 
the detail. This one I have here in Portsmouth, so if anybody wants to come visit my studio, you can see this one. After I was working with beads, I think that I started to have this yearning to think about what else can I do with them. And this piece is a bronze candlestick from the uh, Renaissance in the 1500s. And so I made, this is a really dark slide, so I'm going to go to the next one, but I made a little series of boxes uh, that were about four inches tall and had that little shape to it. So the bead is on top, but the glass right here is made with a lost wax casting technique that I'm going to show you and walk you through that process later. I also made candlesticks, which are quite tall, and those beads are about the size of golf balls. Those are bronze. And then teapots <laughs> as well. My fa fabulous non-functional teapot. Basically, it's a box. <laughs> No, you can't even pick it up by the handle. Uh, so I made, this is the last one that I made just last year. And here it is on my jewelry bench. It's upside down. I'm trying to figure out the connection to make it all fit together. And there it is finished. So a teapot. So flame worked and cast crystal. And then I had a baby. So all that big work went away. And I started making little work. Um, the other thing that happened is, you know, having all this time in the studio without children is just a luxury, <laughs> unbelievable luxury. <laughs> and then throw a baby in there, and it's just like, okay, I've got 10 minutes to work. And, you know, I, everything came down really, really tiny, but I compacted it with lots of detail. And um, I like to say that having children gave me a different sense of color <laughs> <laughs> in my life and get, gave me play. You know, um, I showed you slides before that had a lot of color in, in them, but you can really take a timeline if you were going to separate it. You could see before children, the colors that I had, and after children, the other colors I had. And, and they really introduced something. My daughter is 12 now. She'd be horrified by this because she has given up sugar and um, on her own fruition, which is a lecture for another day that I'm happy to talk to anybody else about. Uh, so color and tiny details is what happened. So I want to walk you through the making of one of those necklaces. What I do is I make and I make and I make. I'll sit at the torch for a couple weeks and make the beads and continue to try to push the patterns and push the colors. Once that's done, then I start to get a collection of things that make sense. In this case, I had a client that wanted these amber red colors. So I kept on working that until I got an idea of how the necklace was going to come out. And I wanted the, the base piece to be detachable. And then I sit down at the metals bench, and you can see all those little rings and all those little plates. They all get put together and bent and soldered. I have an assistant. <laughs> I, like, I like to say that my assistant's not that good. He's super cute, but I do all the metal work myself. <laughs> and then so you can see these parts. This is almost at the, part, uh, the place where I can start to put them together and think about polishing. Then I go to polishing. If anybody's interested in the actual mechanism, um, the center piece is a little tube that's threaded. And then a lot of these beads get put together with like a little screw. And that's the finished piece. So a lot of manipulating time. Then now the thing that I'm looking at for the work currently is this is a piece from, I think it's in um, the San Marco in Venice. And I love the idea of uh, chalices or things that might not be utilitarian but have some sort of importance. These are Nuremberg goblets from Germany that were done in the 1700s. And if you can kind of keep the image on the left in mind, I'm going to walk you through a piece that I've created with this kind of concept. So I went to a potter in Merrimack, Massachusetts, Iris Mink, and I asked her to make me blanks. From those blanks, I took them home. This is actually not, gonna, the goblet's on the left. You can see this is going to be a little box. There's the drawing of the goblet, and here are the blanks that she made me that will be the cast top parts of the goblet. Then I went and I had a residency at Corning for a month, which is a real gift to be able to um, sit there and work day in and day out for a month. And I made these molds. 
So those, the horrible pink is what the color of the um, silicone rubber comes in. And the point of this being is I needed to get positive wax images of those blanks that the potter had um, thrown for me. From there, I invest them in plaster and silica. So now there's the plaster and silica inside is the wax. I flip it around, there's the wax. Now I've got to get the wax out. So I'm going to steam it, and now all the wax is out. So now I have the negative image of what I really want to be in glass. And what's nice about these photos is they're so nice and clean and tidy. It's a messy process. <laughs> you have an apron, and you're mixing, and you got flour, and all that stuff. So now they're all filled with chunks of glass. The glass that I used for this particular piece was New Zealand ca casting crystal. It has a 42% uh, uh, lead level, which means it melts really beautifully. Then I pop them into the kiln, happy into the kiln. And then, uh, four days I think they were in the kiln. When they come out, you can see instead of chunks, now they're all smooth. And now you have to break them off. So you open them up. All that plaster and silica now goes into the trash can, and you get this really, it looks like archaeology. When you open it up, it's like a treasure on the inside. Here's the glass from the casting. And then you need to go into what we call the cold shop. The cold shop, if you've ever seen anybody blow glass, that's usually done in the hot shop. And if you're then going to grind it and polish it, that's done in the cold shop. And all the machines there usually run on water. So um, you wear your wet apron, and you go in there and grind away. And then this is the result, which I think that the combination of the bubbles and that milkiness, that opalescent, where it's slightly transparent, slightly not, I love, and then to polish the surface, I think, is gorgeous. And there's the, the final piece. So bronze, um, the bronze here was cast locally uh, in Elliott at Green Foundry. I adore the people there. And then um, I flame work the beads, and then there's the top. Also, there's another technique of working on a lathe. You can take the, for my work, I'm taking the ground pieces and trying to get other surfaces on the glass. And I made the series of boxes. So you can see all those lines that are cut there. Those are cut after. Those are cold worked as well. Um, it's the same technique if you've ever got um, fine crystal or German glasses that have all those little flowers carved around the outside. It's the same technique. Um, the Italians call this battuto for ham little hammer marks. But instead of hammering, it's actually ground. So it's just this beautiful little technique. It's interesting because the Italians really love the purity of their glass, and they don't want to have bubbles in it. So when I uh, was in Venice learning to do this battuto technique, all the Italians were like, oh, but the bubbles. Oh, you know, they couldn't stand <laughs> seeing those bubbles on there. But I like the the contrast between something cast and then something ground. So sort of that imperfection and the perfection. And that's the scale of it. So here I am in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, it, it's interesting talking to a local uh, community because I often talk to people who don't really know where Portsmouth is, but now you know very well. I'm on South Street, um, not far from Newcastle Ave. I'm one of the last asbestos houses on South Street, uh, <laughs> holding on there. I've had this house for 20 years, so I feel really fortunate to be there. Uh, the little garage in the backyard is where my studio is now, and I'm going to show you the, the process of that construction. But right here is the little walk-in basement that I have, and that's where all the magic happens. <laughs> so for all those 20 years, all the pieces that you just saw, um, running through the slides, they've all been made here in the basement of my New Englander. I have a little tin top table. That's where all the glass is piled up on the wall. You can see I have a little sink. Um, this right here is a little flat grinder. It works almost like a potter's wheel, but you put diamond pads on it and you can grind the glass. Um, little <laughs> polishing station looking around the corner. Um, you can see my washing machine, and that's where I keep my diamond pads for the grinder, right up against it, because they're magnetic. <laughs> 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 so
so the, the truth is, I think that this, these are some of the things that I like is, I feel proud of my work because I love it. And I feel proud that I have raised my family with the work that I do. It's gratifying beyond you know means I, I you know I've worked in restaurants I've done work for other people uh, I feel like I've worked really hard and I work really hard for myself and that's okay and nothing is really perfect you know I have this little line on the floor is from the um, propane tank that I have tucked on the other side of the room which is I shouldn't say that out loud, actually. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because I never, you know, put it on the other side of the building. And um, it's, you can make it. You can do these things. It just takes the energy and the drive. It, you don't need to set it up. Well, for me, I didn't need to set it up all perfectly in order to work. I just needed to work. And then everything on the outside sort of happened, you know, on its own. And the same thing goes with the glass. I wanted to say that, oh, so you can see the boxes. See, there's my jewelry bench. I can see little boxes getting finished right there. Um, glass is not a precious material. It is silica, lime, and sodium. And it's the energy that you put into it that makes it precious. So, for all those 20 years, I worked in the basement, but I always had sights on this little building, which was the garage, which we took down <laughs> last year. The exciting part, right? Ready for a little construction? I love process, can you tell? Okay, <laughs> saved all the floorboards, thanks to my girlfriend, who one day walked in and said, what are you gonna do with those floorboards? And I was like, I don't know. She said, well, if you don't want them, I'm gonna keep, um, you know, I would really like them. And I thought, oh no, I want them. <laughs> <laughs> Never wanted them before until she said that. So thank you, Wendy, for that. <laughs> um, and then it's amazing how big the foundation needs to be for such a little building. So built the foundation and then filled it all in, little brick wall, built it up. And then here's for those people who work in um, social media. I put this up on Facebook, holding the, um, the nail gun, and I got lots of comments saying, I really like your work, and you are so awesome because you're building your own studio. <laughs> 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 so it's interesting how, <laughs> no, I wasn't building it myself, I was just handing the gun to somebody else. <laughs> Um, there's the inside, and now I'm out of the basement. I can see the little path. So those of you who know that the, it looks out on the little path that's the um, back walkway to Little Harbor School. So there it is in the back. There it is. There it is with grass. So if you walk on that little path to Little Harbor School, you get to see it. That's my building. Um, so I'm in there now. There's the interior. It's a little bit dark, but there are the floorboards um, have been made into the central table where I can now teach along with the, um, all the tables that I have around the outside. I have drawers now, I never had drawers before. I can keep my glass in these drawers. There's my torch, all my glass rods. And I have a little, I call it the gallery. It's about this big. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's almost like a, um, a little water closet. But there's my gallery space and then, it's a 15 by 30 studio and it is just right. And there it is. That's awesome. I open it um, once a year with the Portsmouth holiday um, tour, arts tour. So it's always the weekend before Thanksgiving if anybody wants to come by. And now going back to what's the most current thing, I was uh, teaching at Corning this summer and I was just there last week for a little event. They not only have the new um, glass uh, building that you saw that's all white, but right next to it, Stu Ben used to have their factory, and they took the Stu Ben factory and they turned it into a 600 seat amphitheater hot shop. It's one of the finest hot shops in the world. And then they have these bleachers where 600 people can watch. I was invited to do a demonstration there, which 
was very nerve-wracking because I'm usually a flame worker working very tiny by myself on you know a scale that's two inches by two inches. So by doing this, I got to um, orchestrate uh, a hotshot team and have them make me something. So in describing it, I drew out what I wanted to do was I want to make a big chandelier now. So you can imagine the chandelier and then all the glass parts attached to it. And here I am describing the bottom finial and the color. They had done a bunch of color tests for me. And here's the scale of it. Whoa. So <laughs> George, <laughs> George Kennard was the gaffer that day. And I think that there's probably only a very small handful of people in the world who could blow like this. And he is one of them in this facility being able to get into a glory hole that big and then getting into the annealers. The one that he did that day is on YouTube. You can access it if you want to sit for an hour and watch a glass blower work. Um, in the end, when it's cracked off the punty, it had a big hole in it. There was about six inches. And um, so when I left, that piece wasn't done. He blew it another time, spent another hour working on it, cracked it off, broke it again. And then he did it a third time, and I just picked it up last week. So it's in my studio sitting there. So it did come out, and I'll be making a big chandelier. So it's trying to figure out the, the bronze parts and the flame working parts and the connections to all of that. But in the meantime, you can see my calipers. That's two inches. So my life is really, you know, it's getting big in the sense that I have these, you know, chandelier, but then in reality, you know, everything happens in this, this tiny scale. So thank you. Thank you.